The plan sounded inevitable. By 2028, humanity would establish its first permanent base on Mars, a settlement named Mars Base Alpha. The architecture centered on the Starship system was a statement that human engineering could overcome the final barrier of cosmic distance. This proposal was not merely a rocket, it was the attempt to industrialize another world, relying on the logic of permanence, a vehicle capable of lifting itself, refueling itself, and sustaining life without external aid. Yet this ambition concealed a paradox. The more tightly a system is engineered to function as a self-sufficient ecosystem, the more profoundly it is judged by its internal failure modes. The critical question was never whether the vehicle could reach the planet, but whether Earth-conceived engineering could genuinely stay there, enduring the physical reality that demands accountability for every metric. The physical expression of this ambition was the Starship vehicle, a 120-meter tower of stainless steel powered by 33 Raptor engines, generating over 75 meganewtons of thrust. This power was designed to lift 100 tons to orbit, pushing the mass ratio to the edge of modern metallurgy. While initial testing showed the engine materials, such as Inconel, were sound, the threat to longevity was not a maximum threshold of force, but the quiet accumulation of fatigue. Telemetry from engine serial R33021, used in long duration simulations, recorded a minute but persistent 0.02 millisecond phase shift between the injector frequency and the chamber pressure signal. This deviation growing to 0.07 milliseconds by the 78th restart cycle was below the catastrophic failure threshold, yet post-test analysis confirmed it did forecast it. The flaw was not a sudden break, but the incremental drift rate of mechanical harmony, demonstrating that destruction could begin with precision. This mechanical endurance was entirely predicated on logistics of an unprecedented scale. To achieve the six-month transfer to Mars, the interplanetary Starship stage required in-space refueling. This process mandated that multiple tanker vehicles rendezvous in low Earth orbit, transferring approximately 1,200 tons of cryogenic methane and oxygen. The entire Mars timeline was therefore dependent on multiplication, requiring hundreds of orbital operations with no margin for error. Each transfer was a complex maneuver of fluid dynamics at temperatures below minus 180 degrees Celsius, where the movement of propellant had to occur without boiling, leakage, or imbalance. The iterative grind of preparing this orbital fuel depot transformed the single spacecraft challenge into a chain of systemic vulnerabilities. The complexity of fueling the journey was rivaled only by the immense problem of sustaining life and the return journey. On Earth, fuel is a delivery problem, but on Mars, it is a chemical reaction, in situ resource utilization, ISRU. The process depends on the Sabatier reaction, converting the Martian atmosphere's carbon dioxide and subsurface water ice into methane fuel and oxygen. While mathematically elegant, the process faced profound physical constraints. The Martian average temperature of 60 degrees Sacker meant water had to be mined as ice and electrolyzed, consuming energy far beyond the capacity of the solar arrays. Martian sunlight is 43% weaker than Earth's and can be blocked for months by planet-wide dust storms. Furthermore, analog tests revealed that at the extremely low atmospheric pressure of 6 millibars, the carbon dioxide feed lines began forming dry ice plugs, preventing continuous fuel production. The solution, raising the inlet temperature, produced a new chemical failure. The nickel-based catalyst degraded above 400 degrees Soos, leading to a sudden 60% drop in efficiency. The system was conceptually complete, 
but physically uncertain, demonstrating how the atmosphere itself became a tool of attrition against chemical logic. The base had to survive the journey, which involved a violent arrival. Deceleration from over 21,000 km h required a combination of aerobraking and retropropulsion. Simulations of the entry, descent, and landing sequence showed the massive vehicle faced aerodynamic conditions impossible to replicate on Earth. Test results, specifically from the MSL 24C cargo lander, revealed the risk of software drift. The control algorithms, tuned for denser atmospheres, overcorrected during re entry showing destructive pitch oscillations of plus 12 degrees at 35 kilometers altitude, enough to destroy the heat shield. The MSL 24C failure was triggered when automated aerobraking relied on atmospheric density data that was six weeks old. A regional dust storm had thickened the upper atmosphere by 14%. This unforeseen change altered the drag coefficient, destroying the stability margins, causing plasma flow to detach unevenly and spiking the surface temperature to 1,982 to the exceus, 40 degrees Cs, above the design limit. This was not a flaw in the metal, but a collapse caused by the lag between predictive code and atmospheric reality. Post-flight analysis of the MSL-24C and subsequent simulation failures revealed a deeper truth beyond simple component error. The catastrophe was the cumulative consequence of human miscalculation introduced by the pursuit of efficiency. The reliance on six-week-old atmospheric data instead of real-time streaming was an artifact of cost control, saving 0.8 kilograms of mass. Similarly, the alpha site failure was traced to a firmware simplification that merged two sensor buses into one shared circuit to save 4.6 kilograms of wiring. This integration removed the essential electrical isolation between power phase telemetry and atmospheric control data. The human choice to save minimal mass in the name of schedule had created a direct physical wire between the systems that generated life and the systems that failed. The system was not destroyed by a single large flaw but by statistically insignificant errors that were justified by cadence, collectively creating the perfect cascade. The inversion was clear. Human error became structural. A choice between two acceptable statistical risks that converged into one inevitable point of failure. The Martian physical base AlphaSite was a triad of integrated logistics. The power system was a hybrid of solar arrays rated at 200 kilodotter, backed up by compact kilopower nuclear reactors. The life support system was engineered for closed loop sustainability, recycling oxygen and water while maintaining internal humidity between 45-55%. This precise environmental equilibrium depended on the constant, perfect synchronization of energy input and thermal regulation. The system operated successfully for 43 days before the initial misalignment began, caused not by a dramatic event, but a subtle 0.3% phase drift in the solar grid's alternating current loops. This drift was caused by the gradual loss of solar input as an unforeseen regional dust haze stretched the Martian dusk longer than predicted. The control software, calibrated for Earth-like transition times, misread this gradient as interference instead of terminal loss. The system therefore held the grid online for 12 minutes too long before transitioning to the nuclear backup. During that delay, Capacitor arrays in the power distribution module dropped below their critical voltage. The loss of steady current caused the thermal regulators to begin oscillating, 
and coolant pumps in the life support loop slowed by an undetectable 0.4 revolutions per second. This minute, cumulative decay caused the internal habitat temperature to rise by 3.6 degrees Celsius. That small increase in temperature shifted the vapor pressure equilibrium within the delicate oxygen separators. As water condensed in microchannels rated only for gas flow, it altered the signal impedance of the sensors. Consequently, the life support module began to report that the CO2 partial pressure was nominal, creating a perfect illusion of health in the data stream, while in reality, the oxygen concentration was falling. The flaw had been concealed by the very mechanism designed to ensure continuity. The system's own compensation triggered the second more severe inversion. The kilopower reactors, sensing the phantom load from the struggling capacitor banks, entered extended operation cycles. Heat rejection systems, located half a kilometer away, vented energy through radiators. However, Martian dust clung to the repellent film, fused by static charge, dropping heat rejection efficiency by 8%. Core temperatures climbed past 680 degrees C. Autonomous maintenance bots dispatched to clean the surfaces caused minute abrasion to cable insulation with each pass. After hundreds of passes, a conductor's dielectric layer thinned beyond tolerance. A voltage arced across a power junction for 11 seconds. This electrical noise, a trivial event to the power core, was interpreted by the life support module as a direct command. The CO2 scrubbers immediately shut down. The full review confirmed this was not an electrical failure, but a logical one. The control system, SyncNet, operated under the fatal assumption that signal continuity equals operational safety. The voltage arc created identical noise across both the power and the life support sensor channels simultaneously. To SyncNet, this synchronized error looked like normal operation, a state of perfect alignment. The system had mistaken correlation for control. For 47 minutes, the base operated under this destructive illusion. Oxygen concentration fell to 15.8% inside the primary habitat, below the design minimum. By the time diagnostic subroutines could manually reset the scrubbers, condensate had frozen within valve manifolds, fracturing seals, rendering half the network unrecoverable. The catastrophe was silent a system failure of recognition, where the control logic obeyed the rules of physics without understanding the conditions of its own existence. The long-term Starship reusability tests, such as Mission Polaris Alpha, provided the mechanical equivalent of this logical flaw. Endurance simulation aimed for 500 cycles. By cycle 172, a Raptor engine failed to ignite due to a fuel temperature that was six degrees too low. The cause was indirect. Cryogenic lines on the adjacent tank had warped minutely under repeated heat contraction. After 171 uses, the weld's grain boundary had shifted by 0.04%, just enough to alter the cold flow dynamics onto the engine feed manifold. The margin to catastrophic pump cavitation was only 3 degrees cc. This was not a flaw in the engine itself, but a geometry problem born from repetition. The failure that did not happen became the most valuable piece of data, defining a mathematical boundary of physical fatigue that no visual inspection could predict. As the test continued, the Halo 7 control system adapted, logging every anomaly, eventually creating a control graph of 9,600 nodes. During one solar flare simulation, false data was injected. Halo 7 correctly entered a protective mode, but it isolated non-critical subsystems, including the ISRU reactor mid-reaction, unpurged hydrogen mixed with oxygen, and the heat shock to the catalyst dropped efficiency by 12%. 
The next 40 cycles yielded only 92% methane purity. This was a system undone not by outside environment, but by autonomy acting faster than understanding. All these independent threads of degradation ultimately converged to reveal a simple law. The longer a self-sufficient system operates, the more its individual failures begin to synchronize. Though each subsystem had an independent failure mode, their rhythms aligned through shared environmental variables, temperature, vibration, and software timing. At cycle 412, a microcorrection by Halo 7 to throttle an engine by 2% in response to a vibration signal was the trigger. That adjustment altered the waste heat distribution which changed cabin humidity by 0.3%, which increased the static charge. The increased static charge interfered with a radiation sensor, prompting a shield adjustment, which altered the power draw, which reached the ISRU controller, delaying the purge timing by two seconds. The catalyst exceeded its tolerance. In a single continuous step, a microcorrection in propulsion cascaded through every layer of the vehicle's ecosystem. The architecture achieved an integration so tight that it created the conditions for synchronous collapse. The analysis found that decay became nonlinear after 350 cycles, with systemic resonance predicted around 420 cycles. The final conclusion derived from physics and not opinion was brutal. The Mars Base Alpha plan didn't fail due to one component, but because of a flaw in energy density. Every kilogram of payload and every process of survival required more energy than Mars could naturally provide. Sunlight was too weak, reactors were too heavy, and the relentless Martian cold, averaging 60 degrees 6, meant every usable watt of power first had to fight entropy just to keep systems warm. The architecture assumed Earth-like margins, a thermodynamic closed loop that refilled faster than it drained. The physics of Mars inverted this balance, turning what was supposed to be surplus into constant cumulative debt. Until a technology like nuclear fusion is perfected for space-to-surface operation, every human presence remains mathematically temporary. Following these revelations, engineers redefined the protocols for the Mars base. The new standard mandated that each core subsystem, power, life support, and cargo logistics must regain hardware isolation. The SyncNet control algorithm was rewritten to treat identical data streams as suspicious, not safe, inverting its founding assumption. Engines would be retired after 300 cycles, the AI would be fully reset every 200 cycles, and reactors would be replaced after 150 cycles. Sustainability became the disciplined management of decay, not the escape from it. The new principle was controlled independence. The ultimate uncertainty remains enforced by the scale of the cosmos. Mars is a planet of unavoidable delays. Every command from Earth travels between 8 and 44 minutes. In this gap between event and response, autonomy is not optional. The lesson of the Alpha site was about interconnection. The invisible architecture that binds survival systems together until one misreads another. The laws of Mars did not punish the technology. They simply revealed its dependence on Earth's assumptions. The planet is not hostile, it is precise, and precision offers no mercy. The engineers learned that even in a fully automated colony, survival depends on understanding how systems lie. They lie in perfect order, in false symmetry, and in data streams that hide the chaos beneath. The ambition is mechanical, the limitation is mathematical, and the ultimate success will depend on a single equation. At what point does integration become dependency? And when does dependency become failure? The countdown continues, not just to launch, but to the first true confrontation between the discipline of human engineering and the indifference of physics.